if I don't know anything, will. <laughs> good, 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 good. Turn to the Gospel of John, chapter 18, with me this morning, please. The Gospel of John, chapter number 18, and verse number 29. <laughs> All right, John 18, 29, one, one verse. Pilate then went out unto them and said, What accusation bring ye against this man? Father, bless your word, this messenger that tries to give it forth and anoint it as it goes forth into the hearts of the people who hear it. In your name I pray. Amen. You can be seated. I'm going to bring you a message this morning about the people around Christ, contemporaries 2,000 years ago when he was here. Pilate represents secular authority. We always have secular authority. For the most part, secular authority is indifferent to the Word of God. Just as long as they maintain Pax Romana or the Peace of Rome, they're happy. That's all they're concerned about. The federal government, for the most part, isn't really interested in what you believe about the Trinity or the atonement or things of that nature. This is Pilate. Pilate, all he cared about was to keep peace among these Jews. And it was not an easy thing because their history, past, future, present, is a history of warfare. Make no mistake about that. But the Jewish leaders came to him. The reason they came to him is because he had the authority to do what they wanted to get done. What was that? They wanted to get rid of Christ. They wanted to get rid of him. They fought the preaching of the word of God. They fought the gospel in his time. The education establishment is, do, is doing the same thing today. They are fighting the preaching or the dissemination of the word of God. They hate God. Now, no, make no mistake about it. We just heard the word a few days ago that some of the classes now in this country, classes we're talking about, five, six, seven, eight-year-olds are being given graphic detail of sodomy and what's involved. And you tell me, my dear friend, where the sense lies in that. That's way over bounds, but that's what's happening. And my friend, I'll tell you right now, if you don't know this, some of you would get sick at your stomach if you knew what was practiced by these people. Make no mistake about it, they are getting sick themselves from what they're doing. Then you have the people around him, the people, the people around the Lord Jesus Christ. In a pure democracy, my dear friend, note this, a pure democracy is a mob against anyone who disagrees with that. In other words, they will run roughshod over the minority. Founding fathers of this country were very smart men. The more you read about them, the more you can appreciate the way that they could look into the future and see the things that are so necessary for us today. So what did they do? They put checks and balances in, but the constitution of this country is not democracy. What constitutes America, in other words, the essence of what puts us together, together and gives us identity and meaning is called the Constitution of the United States of America. That Constitution is supreme law of the land. You should be thankful for that Constitution. It safeguards this republic. Thank God for the republic, not the democracy. I appreciate the democratic form, the way it works in a republic. But if you take the republic out of it, you wouldn't want to live here. Make no mistake about it. They were smart. They gave safeguards. They gave a constitution and they gave us an electoral college. Thank God for that. And they also gave us three branches of government, three distinct separate branches to govern ourselves, a judicial an executive and a legislative. The legislative makes the law. The judicial interprets the law and the executive applies the law. Two forms of applying the law in the power of the executive is the Department of Justice and the other is the FBI and on it goes with the executive branch applying the law. Say, so why is this necessary, preacher? You need to be reminded of who we are and where we came from because folks are living in a mixed up madhouse today. 
So we have a government that was, de that was, that was designed by smart people to give us a homeland where people could live and live in freedom. When something is unconstitutional, it goes against the very fabric and makeup and essence of what we are. Yeah. That's how important that word is. Yeah. Religion is an issue too at the time of Christ. The Jews' religion is mentioned, the word of God. What's the Jews' religion? It is a religion that goes back to the oral law and not the written law. The Jews' religion elevated the oral law above the written law. Why did they do that? Because it is a mystical, personal type religion where they can communicate among themselves and leave the goyim out, and that's us. We're the goyim. We've been excluded from the great truths that can be learned in the Jews' religion. This is all based on the oral law, and the Bible of the oral law is the Talmud. The Talmud today, if you try to witness to a Jew to tell him about the Lord Jesus Christ, he doesn't go to his Bible. He'll go to his Talmud. And therefore, his Talmud becomes the source of his faith. That's a sad thing. It's a book full of contradictions. It is full of pagan influence, especially it relates to the spirit world. To read it, and I've read portions of it, will present to you some of the wildest exegesis of Scripture you will ever hear. It has a system built into it that identifies the Lord Jesus Christ and every form of curse you can imagine is placed upon him. Little to their, I don't think they appreciate this, but the fact is that Christ is all over the Talmud, which proves he was here 2,000 years ago. Came into his own, and his own received him not. Get a Jew saved. Get a Jew saved that's been educated in his religion and he will unfold the Talmud for you and show you what's in it. Then you had the Greek gods of the day. You had the Egyptian gods of the day. You had the mystery religions of the day. The Greek gods of the day at Mount Olympus, Cronus, Hades, Zeus, Hermes, Apollo, Her Hera, Artemis, Aphrodite, and on it goes. They were all connected in one form or another with sex. They were obsessed with sex. When you get off into the pagan religions, make no mistake about it, sex is elevated above everything else. Would you say America is a nation obsessed with sex? Of course it is. And so, my friend, they were heavy into it. The Egyptian religion is Isis, Osiris, so forth. In the Old Testament, you find when Israel had reached the bottom of apostasy that they had women weeping for Tammuz. That's part of that religion. What a thing. Dig into the wall and no telling what you're what liable to find. But then you had the mystery religions, the initiates into the mystery religions. Androgynous priests, male, female. You had gender dysphoria like it's never been known before. It's not a new thing. And so we have get into the business of gender identity, male, female. Where do you think that all of this gender stuff is leading, friend? It's laying the foundation for a new worldwide religion. Flags all over the place. The rainbow flag with the words proud written on to it. Proud. In your face, proud. I don't hate these people. God doesn't hate these people. Christ died on the cross for these people. You may have this in your family. Who knows? It's getting to the point where practically every family does in one sense or another. So what do you do, preacher? Pray for them. Preach the love of Christ and preach the truth to them. And let them know they need the Lord, that there is no hope without him, and that they can change. There are pastors all over this country pastoring churches and preaching the word of God that are former homosexuals. They don't like that. The Lord said male and female created he them. Amen. Male and female, folks. Only two, male, female, XX or XY chromosomes, one or the other. If you have XY chromosomes, I don't care what they say, what they call you, this, you're a male. If you have XX chromosomes, you're a female. That's the way it is. That's the way God made you. Amen. And you shouldn't be ashamed of it either. If you're a woman, praise God. If you're a man, praise God. Amen. What kind of a mess would we be in if we didn't have two sexes today? What you imagine for me? These religions lead to demonism. And now I'm going to get into something with you this morning. Physical manifestations of supernatural ability. What's that? 
A 90 pound woman picks up a 200 pound man and throws him across the room. All oh, preacher stuff, oh yes it does. A psychiatrist got into this to find out what's going on. I'm talking about an MD. I'm talking about a highly educated man. You know what he found? He got into it and he discovered this is a reality that's not in my medical books and it exists. So therefore he began to deal with demons. Amen. Demons are everywhere today. They're all over the place. We've got some in this house this morning. Make no mistake about it. Amen. But greater is he that is in you than he's in the world. You worship the Lord Jesus Christ and lift up his holy name. Preach the cross, the blood of Christ. And they get very unhappy. They don't like that. They don't like that. A boy walks up a wall backward. Now, I know you've heard it a thousand times, but there's a lot who haven't. A boy walks up a wall backward. And it's, and it's witnessed by nurses and workers in the hospital along with the police. And there is absolutely no physical explanation for that whatsoever. Psychiatrist confronted with this undeniable demonic activity accepts the obvious. Then you have the wicked activity of demons. You're beginning to see it now. 19 kids shot to death by a demon-possessed man who walks into that place. It's all over the place. It's everywhere. They're walking into churches armed to the teeth. They're ready to kill you. Make no mistake about it. You live in that age. I think that Knoxville, Tennessee will not be as bad for a while as some of the other places Amen. because of our location, because of the geography of us, because we're part of the Bible Belt. It doesn't, it doesn't exclude us. It simply says that this, what, this thing will move with its tentacles out. America will begin to persecute Christians. It's going to come. It's already in the workplace. It's called political correctness. Then it's called the critical race theory. And it's called a lot of other things. You'll lose your job. If you speak up in a lot of places in the country. And you know that. You know that as well. I'd like to know, wouldn't you? I'd like to know what people are really thinking. Amen. Wouldn't you? Wouldn't it be wonderful to hear what they really think about what's happening in this country? It'd be interesting, wouldn't it? What do you really think about what's going on around you? But you know that especially where you work, you can't say anything about it. But it doesn't stop you from observing and your mind is still clicking. You're still thinking. So what's going on? Eighteen and nineties, a man built a hotel. He put three floors on it. The top floor was a hotel floor. The center floor and the bottom floor and the dungeon he built underneath it was to house his victims. This man would literally take people in. He would take them and he would torture them. And then he would cut their bodies up and sell their body parts. His name was H.H. H. Holmes. Look it up when you, get, when you get home. Look it up on the internet. He was a monster, but he was demon possessed. But let me tell you something. Does it stir your soul to think that he sold body parts? Think about that. Well, 63 million babies have died in this country and they are trafficking in their body parts. Right now, you're sitting in a land that has blood flowing from the death of the innocents. You think God's pleased with that? You think he's happy with that? 63 million. It's unbelievable. The number is mind-boggling. 63 million, folks. Do you know how many people are in Great Britain? 67 million. How many in France? 67 million people. 67 million people, the whole population of Great Britain, 67, I'm not talking about the whole uh, kingdom, but I'm talking about Great Britain, 67 million people. Not far from that, to wipe out a whole country. 63 million have died. Not too long ago, as a matter of fact, 2015, how many of you know what the Empire State Building is? New York, they call it the Empire State. The Empire State Building, beautiful building. It's a building built in the 30s, I think it was, 20s, 30s, somewhere in there. You ought to go back and look at some of the pictures of these guys up there walking around on top of these steel beams. And I mean, <laughs> I mean, one fall and you're finished. And yet they built that building, put it up. And when I was in high school, the Empire State Building was the largest, tallest building in the world. No question about it. Then they built the World Trade Towers. You saw what the Muslims did to that. Well, somebody in 2015 had the bright idea to project an image of Cali on that building. K-A-L-I, Cali, who's that? 
That's a God of murder, lust, war, killing, has a tongue. And I'll leave this up here so you can see it when I get done this morning, a tongue that hangs out and down. Those devotees of Kali are called thuggies, thuggy, thuggy. We get the English word thug directly from that. And it's an amazing thing that 2015, this was projected on this building. And have you noticed the murder rate in New York? Have you noticed that people can't even walk down the street in New York without some thug attacking them? Now notice we're pulling up Hindu deities. We're pulling up Hindu gods. Sir in Switzerland, they built the Large Hadron Colliders. What a remarkable thing. But they put an image of Shiva out in front. And Shiva is a god inside a circle, and Shiva is dancing the Naharaj. What's that? The Naharaj is a dance where Shiva has the power to destroy completely and then rebuild and bring back into existence. They chose that because the Large Hadron Collider sends these particles around and they collide. And when they collide, they destroy. Big Bang. And the process of the Big Bang, they observe what's happening. And by observing that, they go back and think, well, maybe we can understand the Big Bang that took place when it banged somewhere back in eons ago. And here we are. That's what they want you to know. That's for public consumption. But the truth of the matter is it's built over the top of an ancient demonic hole, a worship of a, de of a demon. And sir, why would they pick a Hindu God? Why would they pick somebody like Shiva to put in there? In other words, why are we going with Hindu here? What's going on? What's going on? The World Cup of the Olympics by the BBC says the Godhard, Gotthard base tunnel. Gotthard is a, is a Swiss word, but it's a German word because the Swiss and the German and the Austrians are so closely connected in their language. And sometimes they have the same uh, declension of the nouns and conjugation of the verbs and so forth and so on. They all came from a common source. The word Gotthard means God is strong. This is the deepest, longest tunnel on earth. And when they dedicated that tunnel, they dedicated that tunnel and they brought the heads of state and some of the big shots, big wigs from everywhere. They sat down. They show pictures of these people with their cameras up and they're videoing and they're photographing what's happening in front of them. And the BBC says this, says it was not always possible to understand what was going on in front of their very eyes. Who's the BBC? British Broadcasting Corporation. It's the official arm of news from, from, from Great Britain. And so what's happening here? Well, they have a dead lamb. Yeah, they've got demons flying around. Nine people died in building that thing, and so they bring the nine out, and those nine begin to worship their gods. You see, CERN is opening up the tunnel into the underworld. That's what it's about. It opens the tunnel into the other un underworld and it's connected completely with the Hindu demonism. And so now what we have is this. We have an image of Kali projected against the, against the Empire State Building, which opens up the thuggy. It, op it appeals to demonic spirits. Listen carefully. When Elijah went to the top of Carmel, and the prophets of Baal and the Lord God Almighty had a confrontation. A lot of people think, well, it was in vain that the prophets of Baal cried out to Baal, O oh Baal, O oh Baal, hear us, <laughs> and call fire down. Because Elijah said, let the God that answers by fire, let him be God, right? But it goes a little deeper than that. Because in Revelation chapter number 13, when the Antichrist walks the earth and his false prophet he will have power to call fire down from heaven. So what do you mean by that? I mean this by it. They were accustomed to seeing supernatural things happen from Baal. Do you remember in the Egyptian court when they mimicked the changing of the rod into a serpent? You remember that? They did the same thing. You need to understand that he that letteth will let till he be taken out of the way. 
The supernatural powers of evil are, my friend, are vast. There's no question about that. And don't ever think for a minute that these prophets of Baal were simply dupes who were doing the best they could because they were forced into a corner. No. They thought Baal would bring fire down from heaven on top of Carmel, but he didn't because he came face to face with the God of Abraham, Isaac, and Israel. Amen. Shut him down. And then Elijah (laughs) called upon God. His name, Eliah, means Elohim is Jehovah. You want to know who God is? It's Jehovah. Do you know who the true God is? It's Jehovah. The Jehovah of the Old Testament is the Jesus of the New Testament. Amen. And so what happened? The fire came down and licked up the water, and God Almighty showed himself. And here's what they said. Here's what the, here's what the Israelis said. Go, the ancient, and go read it in your Bible. Jehovah, he is the God. That's the way they said it. The God. He is the God. You see? The, the true God. The God. As opposed to Baal. All right, this is what's happening. They're conjuring up Kali. They're conjuring, conjuring up uh, Shiva. They're conjuring up the demons in the deepest pit. Conjuring them up. They're calling them up. Let me tell you something, folks. I've learned this by experience over the years. Why do they do this? They do this because they are asking for their power. They're seeking their power, their authority. They're receiving it from them. The Bible said the things that the Gentiles offer, they offer to devils, to demons. These demons are real. There's real power here. And they're calling on that power. And they're all right now. And they're and their most holy days coming up in just a few days. It's called All Hallows Eve. Halloween. And they cry out to their God. And my friend, this is what they were doing, and this is what they're doing now. They are crying out for spiritual help, authority, and power to subjugate this world and bring the masses under the control of the Antichrist. Yes. Oh, Baal, hear us. Can you hear him? <laughs> Can you, have you read it? How many of you read that text lately? Elijah was sitting there, boys, what's happening? <laughs> Where's your God? <laughs> he mocked him. <laughs> That's Elijah. He's a prophet. Now, I want you to turn to John chapter number 3 and verse 16. John 3, 16. You know why I learned this scripture? I learned it in the public school system. Do you know I learned the books of the Bible? I learned all of them. By the time I was seven or eight years old, I could quote all the books. Do you know where I learned them? Learned them in the public school system. Learn the books of the Bible in the public. Oh, that was awful, preacher. Yeah, yeah. What you tell me about it? <laughs> John 3, 16. Now read it. For God so loved the world that he gave his only begotten son that whosoever believeth in him should not perish but have everlasting life. For God sent not his son into the world to condemn the world but that the world through him might be saved. Can you get a man saved from that scripture? Is that enough Bible to get him saved? There's nothing about baptism in here. There's nothing about the law in here. None of that. It's just simple statement. Whosoever believeth. All right. The word believe is pistuo. All right. It's just a Greek word. Pistuo means to believe. But the truth of the matter is the word pistuo is a pretty broad meaning. Let me read some of it for you because I want to show you something. Please stick with me. This is important. Pistool, to think to be true, to be persuaded of, to credit, place confidence in, of the thing believed, to credit, have confidence in a moral or religious reference used in the New Testament of the conviction and trust to which a man is impelled by a certain inner and higher prerogative and law of soul to trust in Jesus or God as able to aid either in obtaining or in doing something saving faith Mere acknowledgement of some fact or event, intellectual faith. Do you hear that? To entrust a thing to one, his fidelity to be entrusted with a thing. Pistool. What's that mean? Go to James 2.19 and you'll see how it works. James chapter number 2 and verse number 19. A lot of people hate James. 
James is a practical book. James gives you definitions to words that you really don't get out of a dictionary or a lexicon. James chapter number 2 verse 19. He says, Thou believest there is one God, thou doest well. The devils also believe and tremble. The word tremble there is friso. It means to shudder. To be struck with extreme fear. To be horrified. If you only know, if we only knew, the fear that the demonic world has for the blood of Christ and the Lord Jesus, the resurrected Son of God. But now watch this. James uses the same word that John uses, pistuo. Thou believest, pistuo. One God, thou doest well, the devils also. Pistuo. They believe and tremble. So wait a minute, preacher. Isn't that confusing? No. Not at all. You see, there are people in the book of James who said they believed. They believed. All right. Some of you say you're a believer. You believe. All right. The word that you use for believe, pistuo. I believe. Pistuo. But the way I live my life and what I do toward the Lord Jesus Christ defines the pistuo that I believe by compared to that one you believe by. Some of you, and remember what it says here, mere acknowledgement of some fact or event, intellectual faith. See, that's included in the meaning of pistuo. Like I say, it's a broad meaning. The uses is of the word. That's some of you. Are you that? Are you one who gives an acknowledgement of some fact or event? Intellectual faith? All in your head? But it doesn't change your life? It doesn't put the love of God in your soul? It doesn't draw you near to the Lord? I've got an intellectual fact. I believe that Abraham Lincoln lived. He was the 16th president. I believe that George Washington lived. No question in my mind. I believe that these men lived. I don't put faith in them. I don't pull my soul to them. I don't try to receive them. I respect them, absolutely. But I don't pull them into my soul and the innermost being of who I am and say, you are the one that I believe in. That's the difference. Which one are you today? Are you the one that gives lip service to intellectual facts? Or do you reach forth from your heart? Saving faith, the old timers called it, that changes your life. Which one is it? Oh, that you would. Oh, that you would. A smart man says that there's only 18 inches between heaven and hell. What's here save you. What's here will not save you. Short distance here, isn't it? Not far. Where's yours? Is it in your heart? Then rejoice. Is it not? Then call upon him today. For God so loved the world that he put your name world. For God so loved you that he gave his only begotten son that you should believe. Whosoever should believe should be saved. Amen. Amen. And have eternal life. Father, bless your word. In my name I pray. Amen. Have you been saved? Hallelujah, God. If you have, I'll rejoice with you and praise God and we'll sing and we'll worship God and we'll shout. If we're saved and you're saved and I'm saved, then we're brothers and sisters in the Lord and we got everything in the world that we need to rejoice and come before the Lord. But if you're not saved, there's always going to be a problem. You may agree with what I say and you may say you believe what I say, but it doesn't change your life. It doesn't do what real saving faith will do. What have we got, brother? 382 in the All-American Church hymnal, Softly and Tenderly. Would you come? Earnestly, tenderly, Jesus is. 